1 Corinthians 6. We are going to be talking about lawsuits among believers in the first part of it. And we're gonna go ahead and just jump right into verse one so I can get out of the way. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare to go to the law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? We read about this in 1 Peter 4, 17. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? It's not our job to judge unbelievers, but we are called to judge our own for the good of the sinning members in our church. When we refuse to lovingly address unrepentant sin, we are limiting God's presence by not functioning as a biblically centered church. Paul isn't saying that we should never go to court. In this case, he's talking about trivial cases. Serious crimes need to go to the proper authorities. And we see this in Romans 13, 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. What we're seeing here is that Paul is saying murder, serious crimes, that needs to go to the proper courts. What's happening right now in Corinth is that they're having trivial cases or matters that are, that are popping up. For some of us ex-criminals, more like misdemeanors and civil lawsuits is what's going on. And they are, um, they're taking it out into the world and they're letting the world judge them instead of keeping it within the church. So verse two, or do you not know that the saints will judge the world and if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels how much more then matters pertaining to this life? The Bible is not entirely clear about what form this judgment by the saints over the world and the angels will take. This does not likely mean deciding the fate of these beings. It could be about taking positions over them. Are the angels, Paul mentions here, fallen angels, demons, who will face Christ's judgment in the end? We're not really sure. There's a lot of commentary that goes in several directions on this. But I think the point is that we're going to be called into a place when we walk through the gate that we're going to be exercising under Jesus' authority. Right? We all have an inheritance. He's, he's gifted us. He's, he's equipped us. We're going to be standing at an obviously an elevated position than where we currently are. So within our church, why can't we handle these little matters that take place? I've noticed something as being an usher here. That every time I go and, and check that door, make sure it's locked while, while service is going on. That I've noticed that the faces are changing within the church. It's almost like a yearly or, or a couple year cycle. Where's our brothers and sisters going? What offenses are taking place? How does the enemy step in? What's happening that we don't address it in here? Instead, we just walk out and go somewhere else. This was going on back then, but I still believe this is happening today. That we're not coming together. That yes, on staff, pastors, we typically hear one, one person's side. We never get together. We don't talk about what's going on. We don't talk about the matters that are taking a place. We don't talk about the offense or hurt that's happened. Instead, we go somewhere else. This is our family. We shouldn't be cycling through. We should be growing. We should be blowing out these walls. So I say this to you that if you are going through something or you felt you hurt, you got hurt or whatever's going on, please come to somebody. If you don't know anybody, if you're not trusting yet, pray to God. He'll show the people to, that you should go to. But first and foremost, go to your pastors. Go to Pastor Jerry and Pastor Russell. Talk to them. That's what they're here for. We also see about judging and mentions in Revelations 2:25 to 26. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, 
to him I will give authority over the nations. And that was the authority I was talking about. Verse four. So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers. In Corinth, court took place in the middle of a marketplace. People would spend their day watching the different trials. It was almost a form of entertainment. I believe Nathan had touched on that too. The commentaries I heard, they, they said, listen, we're still going through the same thing. Judge Judy, people's court. So why would we as believers take those matters out into a public spectacle is what Paul's trying to say. What are you doing? You know, keep it in the house. Verse seven, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Here, Paul is concerned with the damage such petty lawsuits can do to the name of Christ. Bringing trivial matters before the world did not bring God glory in the eyes of the unbelievers. In fact, it brought division in the church. We read about this in 1 Peter 2.12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be above reproach in all things that we do. But I say that also that we're not gonna walk perfect. We're gonna mess up and we typically mess up in front of the world. I've had my own personal experiences where when I messed up, I would go back and apologize for what happened. Now, what a testimony that is, that one day without Jesus, speaking of myself, an angry person that wouldn't admit guilt, that was always trying to manipulate things, to then in front of those same people to, to fumble, to make mistakes and go back and say, listen, God put on my heart, I'm supposed to apologize. I'm not supposed to be like this. I'm sorry. It goes so far with people. You know, we don't have to go and beat the Bible over everybody's head. It's not our words typically that we're saying that's going to bring people to Christ. Typically our bad words are gonna push them away, but our actions, when we're walking in spirit, that's what's gonna draw them, that's what's gonna let them see the glory of God. Did we leave off on eight? but you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. And he's frustrated, I mean, there's an exclamation point, if my mouth wasn't so dry, I was supposed to be screaming this point at you guys. Right here, Paul's frustrations could be more from the fact that there are people in the church, right, brothers and sisters, that were willing to do wrong to their brothers in Christ. That's the frustration. See, he was here a year and a half ago, I don't know, excuse me, about five years ago, and he spent about a year and a half in Corinth building the church, discipling to them, ministering to them, you know, showing them Christ and Christ that's in him. And when he leaves, he's getting these reports of people going to court against each other, having lawsuits against each other. Yes, there's the public embarrassment, but the point more is what they were doing to each other. We're family. We're supposed to be loving each other. We're not supposed to be going out of our way to cause griefs and problems with each other. We should be here to help each other, pick up each other. You know, God, that is God in us. And so when they're acting like that, where's God in this entire story? We're not hearing about Jesus, we're hearing about them frauding each other. So as mentioned before, what happens if we have an issue in the church? What are they supposed to do? Not supposed to go to court, Supposed to bring it in the church. So if both parties agree to go to the church to arbitrate, and one of the sides is not willing to come to a reasonable agreement, Paul gives a simple answer. I personally don't like this answer. That's why it's probably a good one. He says to lose. In 2 Corinthians 12, 10, he says, for the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, 
then I am strong. Right there, what he's saying is, turn the other cheek, like Jesus said. God is going to pick up the pieces. But that's a hard thing to do. I typically am spending my day trying to figure out how I'm gonna win the day, not lose the day. Verse nine, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. While I was studying to speak tonight, I focused so much on this verse, so much. I started listening to so many commentaries. I spoke to a lot of you about it. One thing that I noticed, every commentary that I heard, it, it, it seemed like we always focused on somebody else's sin and no one ever talked about the sins they were dealing with. I don't think that helps us. That doesn't help to advance us. And that's where, through our transparency of what we're going through, is going to allow God to come in and move mountains for us. So I would encourage you to stop focusing on other people's sins and start working with God about yours. Because to address one, we need to address all of them. And I'm pretty sure when we pull out the descriptions, the definitions of each one, I mean, how many steak knives from Outback has somebody taken before? That's a thief. <laughs> So we always typically want to elevate our sin, right? We want to, you know, the stuff we do, it's just white lies, it's just petty stuff, but in God's, God's eyes, it's not. Sin is sin. And so if you want to pick on one, remember rocks and glass houses, be careful. Because we're not supposed to be coming after people's sins at all out there. We're supposed to be showing them the love of Jesus. And I don't think I've ever read anywhere in there about him coming in to the non-believers and beating them up for where they're at and what they're doing. So 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. What we're just talking about, those sins, those labels, those identities, if you've accepted the Lord, it's not you anymore. It says you were washed. Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not because of works done by us. Not works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. What that's saying is that you have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. What happened before you were cleansed doesn't exist anymore, it's gone. It's a gift by his mercy. You are sanctified. We have been set apart for God's purposes as God's children. You were once here with everybody else, but he's literally picked you up and set you apart, put you into the kingdom with your family. Again, it's not about the things we read the verse before, if you've accepted the Lord. And this is Amazing, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. What those three things mean, I want guys want you to understand this and believe this, that you are not guilty. You are not guilty. And you are not guilty. It's gone, so let it go. Yeah, give them praise. He did that for us. We struggle with our self-worth and our, our value so much. 
but he did that for us. You know, and I know it could be hard when we, when we go book by book and something, we get verses that, you know, we've walked in with, with only God knows what. But you don't have to hold on to it. You don't have to let it weigh you down. It's not for you to carry. It's his yoke is light. Give him, give him your yoke. And if the world is trying to identify you as something other than you being a child of God, it's a lie from the enemy. Straight from the pit of hell. And you move on from it. And you don't identify as that. Verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but all, not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach. I know that. And the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. The Corinthians were a real carnal church. They would say, I've got a bodily appetite, so I need to satisfy it. This comment began to extend past just eating, and some would argue that their sexual cravings needed to be satisfied as well. Remember, we previously talked about at nighttime, there were temples set up by the pagans, that there were prostitutes, that people would go at night and obviously do what they do. This is a great example of what carnal is, and the definition is to live carnally satisfies the flesh rather than pleasing and honoring God. Churchgoers would seek to fulfill these cravings with prostitutes from the pagan temple. When we are living in the flesh and not in the spirit, our day-to-day -day will become stressful. You guys ever feel that? It's real easy to step out of walking in the spirit. I know for myself, it's a constant reminder throughout the day. Even when I came out here, I walked right out in the flesh and just started trying to jump into it. It happens that quick. And even with something like that, so imagine through our day. So if something is starting to rub you the wrong way, just stop. It's okay to stop and ask God to reset. Fourteen. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. John 6, 40, this is Jesus talking. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Praise God. 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. This is talking about the design, the original design of God with marriage and having a helpmate and obviously binding that agreement and becoming one. Genesis 2.24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Going back to what the churchgoers were doing and some of the reports Paul was getting, they took it the other way. They were having sex with a prostitute and when this happens, you become one body with her as well. This is not what the Lord had intended. And we're talking about the prostitutes, but this is anything outside of marriage. I too came from the world. And so, the, you know, it's, there's a point of identifying what might still be sitting in your heart and asking God to remove and ask for forgiveness. But just like we talked about, what happened yesterday before we accept the Lord, it's done. It's no more. We don't have to walk in it. 17. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. 
flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. To engage in this or any other sexually immoral relationship is to make Christ and his body part of an illegitimate union. This one flesh union happens by joining to someone other than one's spouse. And we see this. This is, again, back to gray areas. Dating outside of marriage, doing those things outside of marriage, absolutely sin and hurts. But just with any sin, things are, are, are starting to build up. Now we're getting into sexual sin that could cause, it causes emotional, psychological, and spiritual scars. Now we're not just talking about people in flesh. We're also talking about porn. We're talking about lusting after someone so intently that it's adultery. And if you're struggling with, with that, Please talk to somebody. The more that we hide these things, the more the enemy's gonna step in. The more he's gonna hold it against us. The more he's gonna beat us up. Now, if you're married and you're struggling with, with something like this, what did we talk about earlier? God joined us. We're one. And that happened so many times. Any type of issue. Wife, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Are you sure? Because I don't, I, don't I don't think something's right. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm fine. They know. They know what's going on with us. They, they might not understand the, the depravity or, or, or how, how much we're hurting or, or what's going on, but you're one. That's half of you. Your spirit should be feeding off of each other, feeling what's going on. Now, I do want to caution you because my wife and I, when we went through our dark time caused by the things that I did, coming out of that and trying to give her time to allow those wounds to heal, a lot of times the enemy was feeding her accusations against me too, though. So I'm not telling you whatever you feel, it's not a good thing, is always right. Go back to the Lord, seek prayer, get counsel, talk to your spouse. But trust in God and give them the benefit of the doubt too that when they look you in the eyes and say, listen, this time I'm not doing it, give that back to God. He'll answer it, he'll help it, he'll shine the light on it if something's going on. But right now, if you're married and struggling, I pray that those things are removed and that God's healing your marriage right now. That when you walk out of here, that maybe the options you were thinking about taking, leaving each other, that those are removed. That's okay, go ahead. Don't give up. I don't know who I'm speaking to, but don't give up. Please. God's glory comes through when the unsavable becomes savable. They say that with a relationship, absolutely. They say with a marriage that when we've done certain things to each other, that that glass is broken, that you can never put it back together. And I say, then ask God to put that glass back in the fire and create something new, something better. And I'm not here to beat you up if it didn't work out. God, I'm sorry that it didn't work out. Because you know what? My wife should have left me a hundred times over too. And it's only by the grace of God that she did it and the help of my mother. But she had every right to leave me too. And so God has something better and something new for you too. Because remember what happened yesterday is done. But you have to take his gift and accept the Lord. Become his child. I think we're on 19 before I went on a rant. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there with me, guys. 
Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. John 17, 21. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I gotta start taking care of my temple so much better. But it's not about what we see. It's not about what we're seeing in the mirror. It has nothing to do with it. I know I have a tendency of letting my weight be my identity. In fact, it becomes a struggle because it's always going on. But when I look at my wife, I see the gift of God that, and I see his face on her. And I hope that you guys see that for the people around you, but there's something that breaks down when we look in the mirror and look at ourselves. And so I also, I just ask God that he would give his eyes to us. That no matter where you're at health-wise, no matter what's going on physically, it doesn't matter. It's all going to dust. He has something so much better for us. 20. For you were brought, you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Acts 20, 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. That's really taking everything we've talked about putting it right in that verse. Holy Spirit's made us overseers of our family. What I like that Paul does in this letter, and I'm going from the beginning to the end, is that as we wrap up on chapter six, that he is coming boldly against the reports that he has received. And what we're going to see as we go into the next chapters is his solutions, is his encouragement, his advice to correct. And so as the letter as a whole is a perfect example of how we should be correcting each other through love. It's not always an easy conversation, but it has to be had. When I was reading this, I really, really struggled with the lawsuit issues. I had a hard time dealing with all of the sins that he was listing. And like I told you guys, the commentary really messed me up. I listed about four, four guys, all famous guys, all big churches, and it messed me up. Each time, it, it took me over here, it took me over there. I said, God, I just, I wanna see what, what we're really supposed to be talking about tonight. Through the verses that we've read, my rambling that's gone on, there's something that I hope God's conveyed to you. That you were not in the world. You were not flesh and bone anymore. You were not the pain and the hurt that you've caused somebody else, and you're not what somebody else has done to you. God gave us a beautiful gift. And I, I expect as most of you, am still trying to figure out how amazing that gift is every day. I could say it, but believing it, I'm shown daily that I have trust issues. But there's, there's something that God wanted me to tell each of you, and this was for me too. That if you've accepted the Lord, if you're walking with Jesus, if you have the belief and the understanding of who you are, and you have been saved by Jesus, that you are not 
those things that we talked about. You are not the things that we talked about. As we're talking about him, if you had those thoughts that were popping in your head of maybe things that you have done or things that you've gone through or the pain that's happened, you are not those things. In fact, God wants us to understand this, that you are alive in Christ. You are God's masterpiece. Yes. This should be good. This is the good stuff. You are chosen. You are treasured. Understand that you're priceless. What he did for you, you're priceless. Okay, he handpicked you. You were worth dying for, and he did for all of us. You were healed by his stripes. You were forgiven. So remember, forgive those around you too. So he'll forgive you. <laughs> you are not forsaken. You are precious. You are loved. And always remember this, you're a child of God. Amen. Now, as I was reading those, something might be stirring in you or this fear might have been coming over you that you don't believe that you've received him. Well, now's your chance. So let's pray. <sighs> Lord, we just pray right now that you would show the ones that need to invite you in. So with our heads bowed, if you wanna accept the free gift from God, from Jesus, please raise your hand. Literally all you have to do. Thank you, I see you, I see you. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And just say this, it's simple. We don't have to use religion and read a long book. I'm thankful that we're in here and asking him to come in instead of hitting that truly, truly broken spot where the only thing you could do is cry because I do believe he would come in then too. So everybody together, let's pray. Dear Lord, I ask that you come into my life, Jesus. I don't know what it means and I don't know how to do this, but I trust that you're going to, to give me eternal salvation. Thank you for loving me as I am. And now I wanna give you all, Lord. Please change me, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night, guys.